American Timelines is a member of the Queen City Podcast Network, powered by Ortho Carolina. Find out more at QueenCityPodcastNetwork.com. History for jerks. History, history for jerks. Samantha, that's a hickey. Stranger came in and slid his dress as well. Oh, 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 terrible mess. I was covered in blood. 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 The smell of decomposition was obvious upon driving into the property. So that's probably blood. Covered in blood. Get in the bathroom. into the bathroom. What he, do you he, do? He, he shat on the bed. He shat on the bed. He shat on the bed. Covered in blood. blood. Welcome to another episode of American Timelines. I'm Amy. And I'm a man. That's a man. A man. I'm a man. All right, that's Joe. I'm a grown man. I'm a grown ass you, man. You are. That's true. I got back here. Yeah. And what are we going to talk about today? My name is Joe, and we're going to talk about 1966, y'all. We're in a new mm-hmm. year finally. This is episode 92. We're creeping on up to our spectacular 100th episode. We're going to do a special episode. In the nude. In the nude, in our garage. Uh, we're going to bring back all of the guests that we've ever had. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, all the, all Wolf, the, Wolf Hammerstein. Like two, right? We'll bring in Wolf Hammerstein, and we'll bring in uh, Muppet and... Uh, Aunt, Uncle Ando. Ando, Dando, if he'll have us, if he'll be here. Um, so it'll be like a special variety episode. And everybody's going to laugh and cry because it'll be so touching. Because it's our hundredth episode. Yeah. I mean, things change at your hundredth episode. What happens? Oh, things get real. Oh, I don't think anything's going to change. In fact, things get real and uncomfortable. (laughs) Okay. Things change in one zero zero. It's three digits, y'all. That's true. All right. What happened in 1966? Well, you know how every time we start a new year, I got a bunch of stuff that's either, I don't know the exact date, but it happened that year, but it also gives you kind of a feel for the year and things that were happening. Yes. Well, 1966 is no different. All right. Let's hear them. So I'm going to tell you some of those things. In 1966, the price of an Oldsmobile 98 town sedan. Mm Mm-hmm. You want to take a shot? Um, fifteen hundred dollars. Nope, three thousand three hundred ninety nine dollars. Okay. You're terrible at prices, right? I'm terrible at it, and that that always sucks when somebody down ball, like low balls when you're trying to make trying somebody to make su- it sound so surprise, cheap. and then yeah. somebody totally low balls you. Well, a desktop a desktop calculator in 1966 cost over one thousand dollars. Did it really? Yep. That's that, a crazy. That's $7,500 today, adjusted for inflation. By the early 70s, they were still around 200 bucks. A desktop so calculator? A desktop calculator. God, that's expensive. Yeah, well, it's a new thing. Like This can do math for you. You don't have to do any more abacuses. Isn't that awful that they didn't have calculators before 66? Not desktops. What do you mean not no, desktops? No, they did have, they had them. I'm just telling you what it cost in 1966. I'm just saying, like, you had to do all your math by hand unless you were a rich person. Or with a paper and pen. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Unless you're autistic. And then you love doing that, but... Yep. In 1966, the U.S. Postal Service switched from using... Maybe everybody just had autistic people in in their house. And, yeah, and that was the calculator. Yes. Everybody had yes. one. Yes, everyone and they had did the math. They were form. issued. They were government issued. Yep. In 1966, <laughs> the U.S. Postal Service switched from using passenger trains to transport the majority of mail to using trucks and airplanes. Oh. The loss in revenue caused passenger rail to become unprofitable in the United States. And that's why we don't have passenger trains. Well, we do. We have Amtrak. Yeah, that's it. But that's where you get you get stabbed on Amtrak. Amtrak's crazy. Yeah. And you can't be in a hurry when you're on yep. a damn track. There can be 19-hour delays and nobody bats an eye. Yep, that's right. Until 1966, the Catholic Church had a list of forbidden books which aimed to protect the faith of followers by preventing the reading of immoral books of authors such as Voltaire, Victor Hugo, Immanuel Kant, Descartes, mm-hmm. Galilei, and Pascal. 
Darwin's works were never included in the list. Why not? I don't know. Uh, from 1936 to 1966, mm -hmm. black Americans going on a road trip often had to use a Negro motorist green book that would list businesses that sold to black people. God, that's awful. The book helped travelers avoid one of 10,000 sundown towns, yes. places that it was the law that all non-whites had to leave the town by sundown. By sundown, I know. In 1966, that went away. There was stop making when I was here. when I went to college it, in southeast Missouri. Yeah, you're from a deep there was south. There was a um, sundown town still when I was in college. Oh my god! Pa um, I think it was called pa Perry, Missouri, or something. Now, just for the listener, you would be shocked, but Amy is over two hundred years old. So <laughs> keep that in mind. I am not. He might be Yoda. No. I'm not. The eight track mm -hmm. was a newfangled option on many Ford cars in 1966. Oh, really? It went back that far. Yeah. I always think of it as purely 70s. The first commercial application came in September of 65 when Ford Motor Company, Company introduced factory installed and dealer installed eight track tape players for their 1966 models Mustang, Thunderbird, and Lincoln. So before that, it was just radio in the car. Nobody could yeah. play any kind of music in the car. You couldn't play your own, yeah. I think they had something before the 8-track. By the 1967 model year, all of Ford's vehicles offered the tape player as an upgrade option, the 8-track. Oh, yeah, before that, they had uh, uh, out record albums. No, they did not. They played in there. They had in. something. They did have something weird like that, though, before mm -hmm. the 8-tracks. Maybe those chimey things that used to, like, something like that. the metal. Mm-hmm. Like music boxes, maybe? Yeah, something like that. Um, the film film debuts of 1966. Mm -hmm. 1966 marked the film debut of Candace Bergen in a movie called The Group. Okay. Michael Douglas in a movie called Cast a Giant Shadow. Mm -hmm. Harrison Ford made his debut in 1966. Oh, did he? You know what movie? No. Dead Heat on a Merry-Go-Round? <laughs> Duh. That is about what? You said it like, duh. duh. Like, I yeah. should know that. You haven't heard of that movie? That's where uh, people on merry-go-rounds race each other. Yeah, I don't know. I'm assuming. Yeah. Bette Midler made her debut in Hawaii. Okay. And Helen Mirren in Press for Time. All right. The top television shows were Bonanza, number one on NBC. Mm hmm And then CBS had the next four. The Red Skelton Show, The Andy Griffith Show, The Lucy Show, and The Jackie Gleason Show. Okay. Sense a trend there. Yep. Just have a show and name it after the person. Yeah, that's kind of what they did. That's what they did. That's how they did. Remember when you had all those naked pictures of Jackie Gleason? No. Um, according to the TV show Married with Children, remember that show with yes. Al Bundy? Yep. Al Bundy would say that he scored four touchdowns in a single game while playing for the Polk High School Panthers in the 1966 City Championship game versus Andrew Johnson High School, including the game-winning touchdown in the final seconds against his old nemesis, Spare Tired Dixon. Oh, that was his monologue. Yep. He'd always say that, I guess. And that was that happened then. That fictional lore happened in 1966. 1966. Yep. Um, before I get to specific things, well, I have a couple specific things that I don't really know. It's, they're kind of like their dates span over things. Mm -hmm. Um, Mississippi was the last state to repeal prohibition of alcoholic beverages. Always the last to do everything. In 1966. Like. Yep. Uh, the sheriff of Hines County raided a Mardi Gras ball at the Jackson Country Club where illegal liquor was being served, and many prominent citizens were arrested. The uproar spurred the legislation to pass a law allowing mm -hmm. individual counties to decide for themselves whether they wanted to legalize liquor sales. Yep. So that as soon as the thing. rich people, and that's how, what it's going to be with weed, as soon as the yeah. rich people start getting arrested, yeah. then they'll change the law. Right. That's right. That's how, what it's going to happen. That's what, how it's going to end up. You're right. Um, a, a gal named Stephanie Kowalek. You know who that is? Kowalek? Nope. K W O L E K. Stephanie Kowalek. Mm -hmm. She invented Kevlar. Oh. In 1966. You know what Kevlar is? Yeah. It's like vests are made out of it's it. It's pound for pound, five times stronger than steel. Wow. She was mixing a bunch of chemicals uh, and. 
and happened upon it kind of by accident. That's pretty sweet. Woman did that. Yeah. That science saved stuff so many people's is lives. baffling to just me. Just by mixing a bunch of chemicals. Like I just know. Just sitting there all day. One hand on your beaver, the other hand mixing no, a bunch of chemicals. But, I mean, I can't even begin to, to think about, like, molecular science and stuff. It's so uh, far away There's from so much anything I, I comprehend. Oh, yeah. You can't even comprehend it. Like, I was thinking the other day, I was listening to one of our episodes, and we both were dumbfounded by, <laughs> we were talking about how uh, audio recordings happen. Oh, like radio and TV and stuff? Well, yeah, like, yeah. I think we were talking about that—the black and white TV, or whatever. But I was thinking about—I don't—I don't think I understand what's happening right now. No, I, like, I don't. I'm talking into this microphone. Yeah, I don't understand how this microphone accepts what I'm saying in through these cords, or how it gets on the internet. <laughs> well, that a, a little bit I understand that the X and O's, but like. Just me talking into this thing, like how who invented the microphone and knew that if you did put these things together, It'd make the lot sound louder, it would amplify it, and then and then it goes in that box, and I don't understand how it's record. Like, what's it recording on? Like, if you looked at the recording, like it's got all the ups and downs. I know. Of, Was it like lasers or something? I don't. I don't know. I don't understand how my voice. How did your voice turn into data? It's weird, honey. We're getting too philosophical. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Though. Yeah, I know. All right, because I'm not smarter. I have a caveman brain. It doesn't understand. No, things. mine is the same way. Um, good. We're we're cavemen doing a podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mike McGrady. Do you know who that is? Nope. He was a writer for Newsday, which was a newspaper on New York's Long Island. Yeah. And he was convinced that uh, popular American liter- literary culture had become so base that any book could succeed if enough sex was thrown in. Oh. So he. He tried something in 1966. Wrote the joy of sex. To test his theory, he recruited a team of Newsday colleagues, 19 men and five women, to collaborate on a sexually explicit novel with no literary or social value whatsoever. (laughs) Uh, He co-edited the project with his Newsday colleague, Harvey Aronson, and they had other collaborators that are well-known writers, uh, Mm -hmm. Pulitzer Prize winners, Mm -hmm. uh, Robert Greene and Gene Goltz, and journalist Marilyn Berger, the group wrote the book as deliberately inconsistent hodgepodge with each chapter written by a different author. Some of the chapters had to be heavily edited because they were originally too well written. But the book was submitted for publication under the pseudonym Penelope Ash. Mm-hmm. She was portrayed by Bill Young, McGrady's own sister-in-law, for photographs and meetings with publishers. The publisher, Lyle Stewart, was an independent publisher, then known for controversial books, a bunch with sexual content. Mm-hmm. Um Lyle Stewart would later have a feud with Walter Winchell. Okay. Lyle Stewart also claimed to know Ron Hubbard before Scientology. Anyway, according to Stewart, he had appropriated the cover photo, which was a kneeling nude woman with very long hair down her back. Mm -hmm. And you just see her from the back. You see her shape of her naked butt and her Mm -hmm. feet. Um, Very sexy. Uh, But he he, uh, took that photograph from a Hungarian nudist magazine. The model and photographer later demanded and received payment. But anyway, the book became a bestseller called Naked Came the Stranger. (laughs) I got this from WashingtonPost.com and Wikipedia. That's pretty funny. Yeah, it became a bestseller just because it had a bunch of sex. So that makes me think of that deeper shade of gray or whatever. Oh, yeah, Fifty Shades of Gray. Yeah, you said that was terrible. It's awful. It was unreadable. I couldn't finish it. But everyone loves Loves it. it. I mean, it's it's got a lot of sex in it, but it's it's literally somebody like a freshman in college intro to creative writing class. Now that's your opinion. Some of our listeners may love it. No, so I don't want to hurt their feelings. I'm pretty sure most people would agree. I mean, it's really poorly written. Those of you who love Fifty Shades of Grey and you think Amy's wrong, tweet us at History for Jerks <laughs> and call her a bitch. There you go. If you agree with her that it is garbage, tweet us at History for Jerks and call her. A bad bitch. bitch. A um, badass bitch. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. Or don't tweet at all. But if you don't have Twitter, you can't tweet. Yeah, that's true. And then on, I think, I think, yeah, now we get into things that actually have dates. Okay. And it happened to be on New Year's Day. Yeah. We have a new number one song on Billboard's charts. By Simon and Garfunkel. 
Oh. I'm going to say the lyrics. Okay. And I'm going to say them in French. What? Because you'll get it too easily. Okay. No, I don't know a French. Just no, give me a few. Give I'll me like five gibber- words. I'll say them in j- gibberish. Just give me like five words. I think you can do this in one word. Okay. If we were on a game show and one I would word. win as you and my partner, I'd be like, Amy's going to get this in one word. All right. Simon and Garfunkel. Hello. Um, hello. Darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk yeah. with you again. Yep. What comes after that? Because a vision softly creeping left its seeds while I was sleeping. Oh, yeah. That's gross. Yeah. And, and the, the vision, vision that was planted in my brain still remains within the sounds of silence. That's exactly right. Do you know the next part? In restless dreams, I walked alone. Yes. Narrow streets of cobblestone. Yep. Neath the halo of a street lamp. Yes. I turned my collar to the cold and damp. Yes. When my eyes were stabbed by the flash of a neon light, it split the night and touched the sounds of silence. Boy, you know all the words. I love this. that song. And in the naked light, light I, I saw, saw 10,000 people, maybe more. Yeah. People talking without speaking. This is fantastic podcasting. I just can't believe you know all those words. Yeah, I know all the words to that one. You know all of them, you think? Mm-hmm. Okay, we won't go through that then. Uh, having performed together previously under the name Tom and Jerry mm-hmm. in the late 1950s. Did they really? Yep. Uh, Simon and Garfunkel's partnership had been since dissolved when they began attending college. Mm-hmm. And then in 1963, they regrouped and began performing Simon's so original... So they must have had a turbulent relationship all along. Well, I'm about to tell you. Oh. Uh, in 1963, they regrouped and began performing Simon's original compositions locally in Queens. Mm-hmm. They then billed themselves as Kane and Gar, after old recording pseudonyms and signed up for Gerd's Folk City, a Greenwich Village club that hosted Monday night performances. Now, in September of 63, the duo performed three new songs, among them The Sound of Silence, getting the attention of Columbia Records producer Tom Wilson, Mm -hmm. a young African-American jazz musician who was helping to guide Bob Dylan's transition from folk to rock. Simon convinced Wilson to let him and his partner have a studio audition where a performance of The Sound of Silence got the duo signed to Columbia. Wow, that's pretty sweet. Yeah. This song was written by Paul Simon over several months in 63 and 64. A studio audition led to the duo signing a record deal with Columbia Records, and the song was recorded in March of 64 at Columbia Studios in New York City for inclusion on their debut album, Wednesday Morning, 3 a.m. That's the one thing you have to say about Simon and Garfunkel is the lyrics are poetry. I mean, all of their music. And it is, it and is. I mean, I you've agree. got you've got that and then you've got the Beatles, she loves you, yeah, 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 she loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which isn't yeah. It's not it, it's I mean pop. It, it is. But well, and this is like maybe the first diversion between pop and, and folk. something real, yeah. But I mean, the, meaningful because uh, you listen to any of their songs and it's just poetry, and that's why I know all the lyrics. Because and Paul it, Simon just comes off as real smart, like intelligent, cerebral. I think he's supposed to be a big asshole, though. <laughs> I've heard that. Really? Yeah. No, well, he and Chevy Chase. You know, Chevy Chase yep. is an asshole too. They yeah. That, they had that video together. Yeah, it um, probably is. Anyway, this album was released on October nineteenth of sixty four, mm-hmm. but the album was a commercial failure and led to the group breaking up with Simon returning to England and Art Garfunkel to his studies at Columbia University. And then in 1965, the song began to attract airplay at radio stations mm-hmm. in Boston and through Florida. The growing airplay led Tom Wilson, the song's producer, to remix the track, overdubbing electric instruments and drums. Simon and Garfunkel were not informed of the song's remix until after its release. And oops, and it was released in September of 65. And then the song hit number one. Mm-hmm. Uh, in January, January 1st of 1966, leading to the duo reuniting and hastily recording their second album, which Columbia titled Sounds of Silence, in an attempt to capitalize on the song's success. It was a top 10 hit in multiple countries worldwide. Mm-hmm. It's, it's considered a classic folk rock song. So this doesn't t- say anything about and Simon and Garfunkel's... Just no, just that they came back together yeah. because of this song. They wouldn't have been together if it wasn't for the song hitting it big. Yeah. This remix. The song was added to the National Recording Registry and the Library of Congress for being culturally, historically, or aesthetically important. Uh, mm-hmm. Also, Garfunkel banged Paul Simon's wife. No, I'm just kidding. No, he might have. I, maybe, I don't know. I didn't read knows? any of that. 
Yeah. But that song was number one. It's pretty good. And then that's why they got back together. And uh, and then on January 8th, that song only lasted until January 8th. Okay. Of 64 atop the Billboard charts because the Beatles came back with a great song. Okay. Okay. Try to guess these lyrics. Try to see it my way. Do Try I have to see to it keep my way? Do I have talking? to keep on talking till I, till can't, I can't go on? Go on. Wanna see it your While way? While you see it your way, run the risk, risk of knowing that our love may soon be gone. We, we can, can work, work it out. We can, we work, can it out. work it out. That's a good one. From now on, I'm gonna read the lyrics as uh, James T. Kirk. Yeah, it's a great song. Mm-hmm. Boy, the Beatles were really good. They I were. really like that song. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, this was first issued as a double A side single with Day Tripper. Oh. And the release, this release marked the first time in Britain that both tracks on an artist single were promoted as joint A sides. Yeah, I don't know if I'd ever heard of that before. Yeah, this song was recorded uh, during the band's Rubber Soul sessions. Mm hmm. McCartney wrote the words and music to the verses and the chorus with lyrics that might have been personal, probably a reference to his relationship with Jane Asher. Mm -hmm. You know her? I've, I've heard of her, yeah. McCartney then took the song to John Lennon. And he says, quote, I took it to John to finish it off, and we wrote the middle together, which is nice. Life is very short. There's no time for fussing and fighting, my friend. He turns into the Indian guy at the <laughs> convenience store. No, it doesn't. Yes, it did. <laughs> then it was George Harrison's idea to put the middle into three-quarter time like a German waltz. That came on the session. It was one of the cases of the arrangement being done in a session. And George said, fuck Paul. No, he didn't say that. As with several uh, of his songs over 65 and 66, McCartney drew inspiration for We Can Work It Out from his relationship. I already said that. Um... Anything else interesting about it? No. Okay. They were just saying that. Uh, John Lennon said that you can tell who wrote which because Paul wrote the part that says, we can work it out, we can work it out, real optimistic. And then he wrote the part about life is very short and there's no time for fussing and fighting. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, and then January 10th, 1966, the Ku Klux Klan oh murders Vernon Dahmer, a leader with the civil rights movement and president of the Forest County chapter of the NAACP in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. He was murdered by the white knights of the Ku Klux Klan for his work on recruiting African Americans to vote. Mm. Vernon Dahmer attended Bay Spring High School until the 10th grade failing to graduate, and he was light-skinned enough to pass as a white man, but he chose to forego the privileges of living as a Caucasian man and face the daily challenges of being a black man in Mississippi during oh that time. Oh, my God. Can you imagine? No. How heroic. Yeah. Right? That's amazing. I, mean, I Anybody would yeah. not be blamed if they just chose to just I'll pretend they're white. Yep. So the Dahmers knew, because they were helping black people vote, they knew... They were in danger. They'd been sleeping in shifts after getting numerous death threats throughout the year. Man. The Dahmers had a shotgun by their nightstand in case they heard gunshots and always had the curtains drawn tight at night to make it harder for night riders to see into their home. Kind of reminds me of Malcolm X. Yeah. There's that picture of Malcolm X with a like a machine gun by his window. Mm-hmm. Or Mississippi burning. On January 10th, 1966, the Dahmer home was attacked by the White Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, the family broke. Well, the family woke to the sound of a shotgun being discharged and the sound of gas jugs being thrown through the windows. As Ellie, his wife, went to grab the children, the house erupted into fire. Dahmer returned fire from inside the house to try and distract the Klansmen while he helped hand his daughter Betty down to Ellie. He oh, was man. he was able to leave his burning home, but was severely burned from the waist up. Betty also had severe burns on her arms. Dahmer's home, grocery store, and car were all destroyed in the fire. He was Jeez. taken to the hospital and died due to his lungs being severely burned and smoke inhalation. Before he died, Dahmer had told a local newspaper reporter, I've been active in trying to get people to register to vote. People who don't vote are deadbeats on the state. I figure a man needs to do his own thinking. What happened to us last night can happen to anyone, white or black. At one time, I didn't think so, but I've changed my mind. Man, that's so sad. 
Yeah. Um, the local community, the Chamber of Commerce, under Bob Beach and William Carey, college president. And William Carey, college president, Dr. Ralph Nunkester, led a community effort to rebuild the Dahmer home. Um, a lot of people came together and helped them. Uh, they registered uh, college funds for Dahmer school-aged kids. Four of his sons were in the U.S. military and left their post to help bury their father and oh, reconstruct man. their family home. Authorities indicted 14 men, most with KKK connections, to be tried uh, for the attack on the Dahmer home. Of the 14, 13 were brought to trial, eight on charges of arson and murder. Four were convicted, and Billy Roy Pitts, mm -hmm. former KKK Imperial Wizard Sam Bowers' bodyguard, had dropped his gun at the crime scene, entered a guilty plea, and had his gun turned in as state evidence. Billy faced just three years on his federal sentence. Jeez. However, three out of the four of those convicted were pardoned within four years. Um. I'm sure. In addition, 11 of the defendants were tried on federal charges of conspiracy to intimidate Dahmer because of his civil rights activities. Former KKK Imperial Wizard Sam Bowers, who was believed to have ordered the murder, was tried four times and each time invoked the Fifth Amendment. Each trial ended in a mistrial. Because it was in the Deep South where they were trying him. Mississippi, yep. 25 years after the murder of Dahmer and assault on his family, the case was reopened by the state of Mississippi the case lasted for seven years and ended by the conviction and sentencing to life in prison of Imperial Wizard Bowers in 1998. 1998. Bowers, Isn't Mississippi like the armpit of the United States, wouldn't you say? I don't know. I've never the been butthole there. The butthole of the United States. It's beautiful, though, right? Isn't it beautiful? I don't know. It's so backwards. I mean, yeah, it's just so deep racist, but... Yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's just sad to, to yeah. see that. It's um, like it's like worst in everything. If you look at like education and housing and all of that stuff, like there's this huge poor communities there, and no, like, maybe it's not beautiful. Then I don't know. I've never been there. I haven't either. But just everything I've always heard. I had a friend who was her husband was a uh, orthopedic doctor, and he was training there. He had to serve. Like a year of mm -hmm. whatever you have to do to get your doctor degree mm -hmm. in, in Jackson, Mississippi. Jeez. Deep South. Yep. Um, anyway, that um, Bowers died in a Mississippi State Penitentiary on November 5th, 2006 at the age of 82. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently, only one person ever visited him during his incarceration. Which one was Bowers again? He was the Klan guy that was let off and they didn't try it till 25 years later oh, and right, they right, convicted right. him yeah but they convicted him in 98 yeah. that's something that is you know even though it's in the 60s but only one person came to visit him someone who claimed to be his brother who listed a false address uh and uh, he died of a heart attack after he died an out-of-state relative came to for came forward to claim his body he never got married Wow. And then on a happier note, Wednesday, January 12th, just a, two days after that horrible, awful, mm -hmm. racist murder, Batman premiered on ABC. Da -da 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 -da. Do you know what the dance is called that Batman da -da 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 did that became famous? The Bat Dance? I don't know. No, nope, called the Batusi. Oh. Made famous by Adam West's Batman. If you Google this, you can see him dancing. There's a lot of episodes where he's dancing. It's so ridiculous. Do you know what the Batusi is? I'm sure I if I saw you remember it. it it's a 1960s kind of, style go-go yeah. dance yeah where he's kind of got the V and he goes over his eyes oh like you know, the a Pulp hip, Fiction yeah like the Pulp Fiction they do the Batusi yeah. okay yeah you make a horizontal V sign with one's index and middle fingers on both hands drawing them across the front of the eyes away from the center of the face simultaneously with the eyes roughly between the fingers this is performed in time with the music and is improved upon by continuing to dance with the lower half of the body simultaneously y'all so that's pretty funny that. Tarantino the bat put that in Pulp Fiction. And this is all on Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Quentin Tarantino probably loved Batman. Mm -hmm. And then Thursday, January 13th, 1966, Lewiston, Maine, close to nearby towns of Turner and Buckfield, mm -hmm. with two older sisters and a half-brother, Shane, his mother's Amanda, who was a school secretary, and his father, Wait, William, was an insurance salesman. The birth of the great 
Patrick Dempsey. Oh, come on. Patrick Dempsey's born. He attended Buckfield High School God. and St. Dominican Regional High School. Would you stop? Home of the Saints. And then he moved to Houston, attended Willowbridge High School, home of the Eagles. Notable alumni include Thurman Thomas, the running back, and rapper Scarface. We're not doing notable alumni. Well, here's the thing. <laughs> We're not, but Patrick Dempsey, you didn't know this. In his youth, he participated in juggling competitions. Oh, Nobody would Jesus. know that. They didn't listen to American Timelines. In 1981, he achieved second place at the International Jugglers Association okay, Championship. We're done with in this. the juniors category, just behind Anthony Gatto, who's considered to be the we're best technical juggler of all time. We're done with it. Patrick Dempsey also has dyx- dyslexia, and you don't you do. care. You don't care that Patrick Dempsey has dyslexia. All right, we're moving on. On that same day that Patrick Dempsey was born, though, mm-hmm. Robert C. Weaver becomes the first African-American cabinet member in all of history oh. by being appointed United States Secretary of Interior Housing and Urban Development. Oh. Nah. Who, I don't, how am I supposed to know? I thought you knew everything. How should I know? I think you're a smart woman. How should I know? That's going to be my new catchphrase. It is? How should I know? That's a pretty I'm gonna good... I'm going to say it just like that. That's a pretty good catchphrase. How should I know? And my catchphrase will be I got diarrhea. That's not a catchphrase. It's not? No. It's n- Sorry, can't help you. Got diarrhea. Hey, you want to go to this party? Nope. Got, got diarrhea. diarrhea. That kind of has always been your catchphrase, as long as I've known you. Got diarrhea. Yep. I said it in our vows. That's true. And that brings us to January 26th of 1966, where I understand that you have something to share. Yes. With the listeners. I am going to take us over to... um, Oh, here it comes. Adelaide, Australia today. Oh, this is not... I thought this was American time. It's not Australian. Well, tough titties. This is going to be just... uh, Tough titties to you. Yes. We're going to do this. So I am going to tell the story of the, the disappearance of the Beaumont children. Oh, okay. So there's children that disappeared... On January 26th, 1966, yes. the same day that Will becomes fast friends with Captain Alonzo P. Tucker, an earthling who escapes his alien captors to become a wandering space buccaneer, but Tucker's roguish charm hides a secret that could destroy them all on Lost in Space? Yes, that same wow, day. that same day. So it that morning in Adelaide, Australia, it was already super hot outside. It was like 104 degrees. Here's my trouble. I can't fathom Australia in, in the January. 60s. Oh, in the 60s. I but what was January. Australia? Like, when did Australia even become a thing? Wasn't I, it a prisoner? This isn't the history of Australia. It's history for jerks. Wasn't Australia... Yes. Just answer me this. Wasn't was. Australia a prison country? Yes. Everybody, every other nation just dropped all the prisoners off there. I think it was just mostly England that did. Oh, it was? I'm pretty sure. So anybody who's ever spent time in Australia... Because Australia is an English... Is descended was an from English colony criminals or something like anybody who you ever meet is Australian, they've descended from criminals, right? Or there have been immigrants since then. Mm, that's not as clean, no, that's true. Our daughter's teacher is from Australia, yeah. All right, Mike. So it was really Foster's. hot already, and it was also okay. Australia Day. It was really hot in 1966, but like, do they have rights? Is it a free country in 1966? Yes, is there freedom? So it was Australia television? Day, which is like a Fourth of July type deal that they have. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll play along. So a little after 8.30 a.m. Yeah. Um, In the morning. It's already 90 degrees that yeah. early. No wonder yep. the prisoners are sent there. Jane, nine, and her sister, crime. Arna, seven, and brother, Grant, four, hold left on, their home on. in Somerton Park and walked along Harding Street to the corner. Okay. A seven-year-old and a four-year-old. Nine, seven, and four. Nine, seven, and four. What are the names one more time? Jane, Arna, Jane's and nine, Grant. Arna's seven, Grant is four. Yes. Nine, seven, and four-year-old are walking along the street unattended, no That's right. parents. Now, Which this is normal. was in 1966, keep in mind. Yeah, that was normal in the 60s. Plus, Australia, there's probably no laws. Right. So, uh, Nancy Beaumont, which is the mom... Nancy Beaumont, yeah. She had been. She had told them that after she was done with her chores, she would maybe join them there. But that this was not unusual at all. They always did this. Join them where? Where are they to going? the beach? They're going oh, they're to the going beach. to the beach. I missed that Sorry. little tidbit. I must. Uh, 
sorry, sorry, dozed sorry. off. Um, I maybe not. A, maybe you probably I said it. it. I doze off a lot. So, um, Nancy waves them at the gate, and yep. they go. See you later. Go and to the beach. And they go on the bus for this five minute ride to Glen Ellig, which is where the beach is. The kids take a bus ride. Yes. So, and they've done this before. The parents trusted Jane, the nine year old. She was very okay. responsible, and she took care of her younger children. Well, can you imagine? No. I don't have a... I've never had a nine-year-old that would be responsible for anything. I've never had a 14-year-old that could be responsible Boom, for anything. Burn on our 14-year-old kid who's not responsible. That's right. Burn on him. So... Um, burn. Arna had joked before about Jane finding a boyfriend on the beach, but nobody knows if that was premonition or if that was just... Her being maybe there silly was a boy she was flirting with. That's nine is too young to flirt, man. Yeah, although so, it is the sixties, things were different. Jane was trustworthy, and even on Saturdays, Jane and Arna would go to the cinema alone a lot really? of the time. A nine and seven year old, huh? Mm-hmm. Well, it's the sixties. So Australia. before they left, the mom Nancy went over the, all the do's and don'ts of going unsupervised. You don't well, talk to strangers and parenting. do all that stuff. And she gave them eight shillings and five pence for snacks. I don't know what that means. Just keep that in under your hat for eight now. Eight shillings and five pence? Yeah, that's, that's it's like, it's like be, coins. That, yeah, I know, but that means no, I have no and she frame told them, of reference. And she told them to be back by noon for lunch. Yeah, but is that like 50 bucks? Is that 10 no, cents? No, it's, it's under a dollar. Oh, it is? Yeah. Oh, so that could be 50 bucks or that could be one, it could be 13 cents. All right, you no made idea. your point. You made your point. I don't know how money works. So they left carrying a bag and a book. You know, Sorry. Just to go off on a little bit of a tangent. What? It just reminds me of when we went to Scotland. Like, people just handed Oh, I know. Coins. Coins, and I had no idea. No idea what like, was any of it. There was no way for me to know at all. Not a single way for me nope. to know if they were... They That's could be right. screwing me over. I they could be hand, buttons. They could be anything. They could be buttons they they're be giving you. They could be anything. <laughs> yep. And they could be giving me complete wrong change, and I would have no idea. Not even money. It could, be, it, could like, be, it could be not even really money. And then really when I would order, I'd order a drink. And they'd be like, okay, whatever. Yep. This is what you owe me. I would just hold out my hand with a bunch of coins and say, That's like developmental this, disabilities. Does, does this in work? The store. Does any yep. of this match what you want? Does this, can yeah. I, do I have enough? I have no idea what this is. I know. Yeah, so I, I lived for a week like a person with developmental yeah, disabilities. Yeah, you did. Anyway, All right. So back anyway. To Australian money that I don't get. Yep. So. Nancy got her chores done Nancy. and decided to, she go, went to visit a friend and rode her bike. Um, and then about 10, 10 a.m. While her kids are just galvan yeah. at the beach. 10, yep. 10 a.m. Kids are supposed to be back by noon for lunch. So this, I guess, yeah, go ahead. So at 10, 10 a.m., the children were spotted boarding the bus by several witnesses. Oh, good kids. The bus driver would remember them, and a woman remembered Jane carrying the book Little Women with her. Okay, Jane is the... The, old, the nine-year-old. Nine-year-old. So at about 10.15, the bus left for the beach. The whereabouts of the children for the next hour is unknown. The local mailman said he spotted them, but then later said he was uncertain what time that was. That local mailman is a drunk. So at 11 o'clock, an elderly woman saw the children playing under a sprinkler, and she said there was a blonde man with blue swimming trunks watching them. Gross. While he was like, at first he was laying down on his kind of on his stomach watching them and then a few minutes later he was actually playing in the sprinkler with them you know i'll bet it's a gross sexual predator the 60s was like a haven mm-hmm. like just anybody you want just rape everyone so at eleven fifteen, several witnesses said they saw this man helping the children put their shorts on which uh, why would you need why would a nine-year-old need help uh, doing that so he has become a prime suspect, and there have been rumors over the years yeah, that he'd been befriending the children for as long as weeks. You know what? Like, grooming them. Yeah, if you're a blonde guy at the beach, number one, you're a suspect. No, I don't. No, we don't, don't need to think? say that. All That's blonde not... all blonde Australians are no, suspects. No, no, no. Okay, so Just around kidding, noon, the people. kids went to Wenzel's Cake Shop, which they frequented so that the owner knew them. Oh, they did? So and that they, was safe? They're safe. Are they, they bought, with this weird blonde guy? Well, he doesn't, the owner doesn't see him, but they bought um, pastries, pies, and a meat pie. And the meat pie is not something they would normally have ever bought. Meat pie. So that was something and, different. So this blonde guy who yeah. I'm picturing, just in all listeners, feel free to li- picture the same person. Mm-hmm. I'm picturing the guy from the Men at Work 
uh, video. You know, what? men at work, men at work. I come from a down end of Vegemite sandwich, that big yeah. blonde guy. I don't know. Because that's Australian. They're Australian. That guy's Australian. He's got blonde hair. All Picture right. that guy. Okay. So the other thing is they used a one pound note to pay, which is like a $20 bill. In, oh. And which they didn't have. Which, right. Yeah, that's why you told me earlier about the money. That's right. That it was See? under a dollar. See it? Now I'm learning about now currency. Now you know it. So the bus stop was right by the bakery, but they didn't get on the bus. They went back to the beach. Oh, so that guy said, go get me some meat pie. And the meat last pie. sighting is 1215, where witnesses saw them waiting outside the changing rooms that were like near oh, the beach. No. Nate, um... Oh, this just makes my stomach turn. So by 2 o'clock p.m., Nancy began becoming concerned when her kids hadn't come home. And she said, I might. So she alerted her husband an hour a, hour later when he came home from work. Jim and Nancy then began to look for the children, and at 5 o'clock p.m., Jim, they went... Jim and Nancy? Yeah. At 5 o'clock p.m., the police came. They called the police. Police came over, searched the house to make sure the kids weren't hiding because that would sometimes happen, I guess. Where I the might. Kids What's the problem? Might. The house. Oh, my kids are missing. Might. Then just trying to get in the field. For I how see. They talk. Okay. Over the next thirty-six hours, the largest mobilization in Australian history for missing persons was mounted. Whoa, really? So there was police, army, navy, oh, air uh, force, yeah. mounted kangaroo riders. Thousands of civilians fanned out in all directions, searching. Yep. Everybody's um, drinking Fosters, Australian for beer. At this point, they just thought that maybe it was an accident that the kids had drown or when covered over that's by sand hope. or that's soil on a landslide <laughs> i mean it, yeah that's what you kind of hope you hope for a landslide yeah um not a horrible rapist so the sand dunes and sand hills were all storm drains and uh, they just looked everywhere i have a feeling this is gonna have a happy ending they're gonna find them all they're unharmed and the guy is a good person <laughs> <laughs> why, so, is, why don't people love that where are, the, are there people that follow I know there's all these true crime mm -hmm. people. Is there people that follow like happy, happy ending endings. stories? Yeah, I'm sure there are. They're nerds. Chicken soup for the soul people. What's that? There's those books. Oh. Chicken soup for the well, soul. Well, consider me a chicken soup for the soul person. <laughs> okay. Um, by Friday, January 28th. Oh, the same day that Lufthansa Flight 005, a Convair CV 440 Metropolis. Metropolitan aborted its landing in heavy rain at Bremen Airport in West Germany, crashed during a subsequent go-around maneuver, killing all 42 passengers and four crew on board. Among the dead were seven members of the Italian Olympic swimming team. That's Oh, day. wow. Yeah, that same day. That was happening. That was actually an interesting one. Oh, wait, wait a minute. What? That, I am... Uh, no. From your language, I am understanding that you are inferring nope. that TV sitcom episodes are aware. Uncle Fester is sixty ninety with Lurch. It's not interesting. Not interesting. So How is that not interesting? So the police began to discount the theory that the children had met with an accident. They started to think it something bad had yeah, happened because the, the the search was sinister. so great. Yep. Um. On Wednesday, February second. Oh, the same day that. If you like that last one, you love this one. American adventurer Nick Piantanadida set off in the Strato Jump 2 from a park in so Sioux Falls, South Dakota, in an attempt to make the highest parachute jump ever and inadvertently reached the highest altitude ever reached by a balloonist. Um, when he reached his target altitude of 110,000 feet. No thanks. Prepared to jump and then discovered the oxygen hose that tethered him to the gondola was frozen. What? And could not be disconnected while he struggled to set himself free. The balloon continued to climb until he was more than 23 miles high. At 123,500 feet, he aborted the parachute jump, separated the gondola from the balloon, and spent the next 32 minutes descending to Earth while the gondola's parachute system slowed his fall. Whoa, that's an action-packed uh, paragraph there. Yeah, but at the same time that happened? Yes. There was a middle-aged woman who came forward, and she said she was sitting on a bench at the beach alongside an elderly couple. Oh, I hate it when middle-aged women sit next to elderly couples. When a man and three children walked up to her, and he asked oh them, he said, have you seen anybody messing around with all clothes? That's English. That's pretty Australian. No, no that was Mike English. Mike Adam Mike. British. Mike. I love, All money's I love, I love. been pinched. So she so said, "What's been pinched? Money. Somebody had stolen the, the blonde the guy money. and the kids. Somebody stole their money. That's what she. That's what she said. 
So she said the description given by the four other people on the day was accurate. So they're all, all the witnesses describe the same. They're man. all describing the same thing. Keep in mind, she's a middle aged woman and a woman. Detectives mixed regarded a her account as reliable. Um, then Mrs. Daphne Gregory reported seeing Jane Arna and Grant Beaumont with a man on Australia Day. Okay. She said he was in his mid thirties. He had light brown hair. Oh, he's not blonde. He was so neatly not... parted and brushed. She went on to say that he walked with his arms bowed like an ape. Well, that's an odd thing. And this description was entitled in the news, The Man with the Crazy Walk. Huh. So a tourist reported seeing the Maybe children. It's a Sasquatch. It might be a Sasquatch. It could be. You're right. So this is a Sasquatch. The to a tourist reported seeing the children leaving with a man roughly matching the description of the suspect. And... Mm. Um, the police consider all these sightings credible as the stories tended to support each other. Okay. This disappearance has been thought to be linked to the Wanda Beach murders about a year before that we talked oh, about, remember? The Wanda Beach murders we talked about. There's other children on the beach. That was Australia, wasn't yes, it? Yes, it was. We might as well rename this podcast Australian Beach Murders. Yeah, and the murder of Wilhelmina Kruger, whose body was found during the early 1966. And I, I talked about that. that during the Wanda Beach murders. You did? I don't yes. remember. I... So Sydney police even became on alert after someone reported seeing the children board a plane that departed Adelaide 20 minutes after the abduction. What? The man on the plane said he saw a blonde man with what looked like the children. Oh, no. Witnesses also described seeing a blonde man lurking at the beach on days leading up to the disappearance. Oh, anytime we see somebody lurking. Lurking is bad. You should be allowed to shoot anybody who's lurking. Yes, that's bad. Anybody. A 19-year-old reported seeing the man with two girls and a boy the day of the disappearance. She said the man was staring at her and watching the three kids running around on the lawn. Weird. They then walked off towards Somerton and uh, the man was following them. The kids did. You know what? The man was following them. You know, just a quick PSA here. If you ever find yourself in the 60s in Australia, mm -hmm. don't leave your kids unattended. Don't do it. So at, they they ended up hiring a psychic who came down from... Um, yeah, because you would in the 60s. He was a Dutch guy. Oh, and Dutch he guys had know. say And he had helped solve some crimes and over in the Netherlands, and so really? they tried to get What's him to come name? down. What's his name? you have his name? Mr. Gerard Croissant. Croissant. Oh, and he also invented the croissant. Yes. He claimed, but he had all these outrageous claims that they were dead, and he had he had seen him in a vision. Now, don't it, just they were dismiss his They were crawling things. on their hands and knees, and the earth tumbles down and covers them, hey, and all this now, weird. now, he's a clairvoyant, so don't you I just give think, that attitude. I just think these kinds of people kind of prey on... Like they're kind of predatory. The the mm. people, the psychics that come in and say that they mm. have visions and they see things. I mean, it's like I think they talk to dead people. No, I think it's haven't bullshit. you ever seen that movie with Haley Joel Joel it's Osment? It's a movie. It's a I movie, see dead honey. people. All so anyway, the time. it's based on a true story. Um, during his search, though, he was shown a warehouse that had recently been erected. The location Direct. in um, the park was a place the Beaumont children were purported to have played. The clairvoyant said the children were either buried there or had been there at some point. Oh. And then in 1967, holes were drilled into the concrete floor and a partial excavation was made. And 30 years later, a complete demolition of the building, but nothing was found. Oh, so you're saying that clairvoyant's full of shit. He's full of shit. So um, the Beaumont parents, some two years after the disappearance... The Beaumont parents received a series of mysterious letters, Ooh. and they were supposedly from Jane, and um, oh, no. she had said that they had were held captive, uh -huh. and that um, children, you know, that they would be returned as a, at a designated time and place. Hmm. And so the Beaumonts got all excited, and they traveled to the prearranged spot, but then no one ever showed up. And then a second letter came, like, shortly after that, and yeah. she said that because there was an undercover detective that was there, that the, um, the, guy, the bad guys wouldn't let the children go and that they were going to keep them forever now. Uh, why would you but want then 25 kids? years later, forensic analysis concluded those letters were a hoax. Why would you do that? I know. What kind of person would pull that hoax? It was a 19-year-old kid. I want to just fuck with somebody who's yeah, grieving. I know. Isn't that awful? So there's a couple suspects. Yeah. In 1998. 98? Arthur Stanley Brown, who was 86 at this time. Wait, 1998, the same year that Randy Moss 
was a great player. All right. He was arrested in Townsville, Queensland, and charged with the, the August 26, 1970 murders of sisters Judith and Susan McKay, age seven and five. Wait, those girls were murdered the same day that Melissa McCarthy was born? Yes. American comedian, TV, and film actress, two-time Emmy Award winner, Melissa McCarthy, born in Plainfield, Illinois? Yes. Um, so he had never come to the attention of the police at the time. But um, there was this ep- television episode of Crime Stoppers, Crime that documented status. the abduction, rape, and murder of the McKay sisters. A relation of Brown's wife contacted the show. She reported her suspicions and told of being raped by him as a child. Ugh. Detectives then interviewed other family members, and they got all the same story mm-hmm. from all these family members. So within yeah. weeks, Brown was arrested and charged with multiple counts of sexual assault and rape involving his eight stepchildren and other related minors. Eight stepchildren? Yep. He was also charged with the murders of the McKay sisters. So it came to light that in 1982, Brown's wife's relations... So his wife's relatives had sought legal advice after individual family members began to learn from one another that they were not the only ones he had molested. The trial of him of Arthur Stanley Brown commenced on October 18th, 1999. Wait a minute. I'm sure you're getting this, but is he the guy that took these kids? Well, that's we don't know. Okay, his this guy's trial commenced the same day that. On Moesha, when Moesha hears that Andel oh is losing the den, she mm-hmm. tries to save it and succeeds only for Andel to be displaced with her efforts. I never watched Moesha. Andel tells no. Moesha that she wants to change from the den and sells it. The gang say goodbye to the den. And the same day that WCW cruiserweight champion Disco Inferno defeated Vampiro on Monday Nitro? That same day? Yeah, I think so. You I think, think that day? I think that was that day. WCW Disco Inferno is a wrestler that liked disco music. So um, the the case that Arthur Stanley Brown, Judith and, Mc, sister, Judith and Susan McKay, um, they disappeared from a- Aitkenvale Township at around 8, 10 a.m. while waiting for the school bus. In what year? I just said in um, 1970. So this was in the 70s. Yeah. And a witness had seen the girls talking to a man who was sitting behind the wheel of a car. Was he blonde? Yeah, he was blonde and he looked a lot like the sketch. And he walked like an ape? I don't know about the ape part. Um, At the trial, it, it was revealed that Brown had worked as a carpenter at the McKay sisters' school at the time. Testimony was also given of two witness sightings of the girls on the day they went missing. Um, and then it goes on, and I won't get too far into that part of the case. But Yeah, not unless it incriminates him in this whole murder we're talking about in the 60s. So um, Arthur Stanley Brown made two confessions on two separate occasions. Oh, here the we go. The first Juicy. was to 19-year-old John White in September 1970. They were drinking in the White Horse Tavern in Charters Towers west of Townsville. I don't know about you, but you just describing this White Horse Tavern makes me want to go there and have a... Brewski. Yeah. So White reported the matter to police, and they interviewed Brown, but he convinced him it was all pub talk, that they were just Because every time I go to a pub, I confess to murders to people. The second time he confessed, it was in 1975, John Hill was an apprentice carpenter to him, to Brown. Okay. He had mentioned the McKay sisters. Yeah. And then Brown had reacted in an exasperated manner, stating, I know all about that. I did it. What? Hill said he did not go to the police as Brown's statement was out of character and he thought he was making it up. For intention. Yes. So at the conclusion of the trial, the jurors couldn't agree on a verdict for that. Um, And then they did a retrial and they did all this. So, So anyways, this media coverage, this widespread media coverage leads this woman to call the police. She claimed Brown was the man she had seen as a teenager with Joanne Ratcliffe. 11 and Kirsty Gordon 4. The children were abducted on August 25th, 1973 from Adelaide Oval where rivals Norwood and North Adelaide were competing in the final of the Australian Rules football. Okay. So there's just a pattern of behavior of so him an, abducting another children. Another person knew, saw him and recognized him from this with these kids. Yes. That were disappeared on the same day that Dave Chappelle was born. That's right. And the same day that Butch Trucks, the Almond Brothers drummer, broke his leg in a car crash? Mm-hmm. That yes. same day? And um, all the sketches 
But they don't know if it's him. They don't know, but all the sketches looked, and he was operating around the same time. He was employed from 1946 as a maintenance carpenter for the Department of Public Works until his retirement at age 65 in 1977. He had unrestricted access to public buildings and worked unsupervised, and his employment records are missing. Police investigations have failed to uncover the dates he took holidays, so they can't tell whether, uh. whether he had alibis during this time. So, um, it's unsolved. Is this it, unsolved? It is an unsolved. We don't oh. know if it was Arthur Stanley Brown. There's one more suspect. Oh, tell me about this prick. This was this guy named Harry Phipps. Oh, he, he did was it. a child abuser and he was a cross dresser. Oh, and his son. Well, that's not, I don't think you can say cross dresser anymore. Can you? Oh, what do you say? Um, alternative clothing prefer. Er? <laughs> His no. son said on the day the Beaumonts disappeared, he saw three children in his backyard. Oh. The importance of this didn't occur to him until after his father died. And Phipps did have an uncanny resemblance to the sketch as well. Phipps? What's his first name? Ha Harry Phipps. Harry Phipps? Yes. I guarantee you Harry Phipps did it because his name is Harry Phipps. Yep. So um, I'm Harry Phipps. The Beaumont the children's beach. disappearance is often credited with a shift toward parents keeping their children indoors. Yeah. Australian parents suddenly found that even responsible children couldn't avoid all the ills of the world. So over 50 years later, the question remains, what happened to the three Beaumont children that, that hot day at the beach? But there was nobody investigating Harry Phipps, or just there was no evidence? There was no evidence. Well, you know, we're safe because our kids never leave the house or ever even stop staring at tablets. That's true. They'll be safe their whole lives long. They just stare at YouTube all day and watch idiots. Yep, they do. And so I got, I got a lot of this from, there was a um, uh, blog by an Australian true crime writer named Stephen Karajis. Car uh, How do you spell it? K A R A D J I S. Courageous. That's what I said. Stephen Courageous. And I got some from the lineup.com, and then True Crime Brewery also did an episode on the Bull Match. Okay, so I'll have you repeat those. Like, keep those handy because at the end we're going to record a little okay. outro. And we'll say, done by this music by Matt Truman Ego Trip. Don't you have to write that? Yeah, no, we'll just wing it. All right. And so that's the story of the missing. Mystery of the Beaumont children. The missing mystery of the Beaumont children. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, what do you think? I, I wish we knew. Yeah, I know. It's kind of a bummer. I want somebody to pay well, for Well, because this. if they if it would have been an accident, you would have found their things. But their things yeah. were gone, too. Oh, like I know it's not an accident. I know somebody took them. Yeah. Because they were with that dude and buying them a meat pie. It's just which yeah. dude and why didn't he pay for it. So... All we can hope is that he is burning in hell as we speak. Yeah, or, or maybe like he just wanted a family and, I mean. Oh, so maybe he didn't rape anybody. That's what, I, I mean, you can hope that, but guaranteed that's not going to be the truth. Yeah. All right, so I think it's time to get out of here, Chuck Berry. Oh, it is? All right. Well, we'll just have to buzz through. Yeah. One month, that's all we did. Who cares? We're not in that in any hurry. Nobody gives a shit. American Timelines was produced by me, us, the History for Jerks. History for Jerks are Joe and Amy, Amy and Joe. We are. Why do you want to do this part? We're a married couple because real podcasts do it. No, they don't. Music. No, they don't. Music by Matt Truman Ego Trip. We always say that part, don't we? Information and history provided by History for Jerks. I mean, provided by Wikipedia. And then you can say those things. Yeah, I just said them. Say them again. <laughs> uh, the lineup.com true crime brewery podcast and Australian true crime writer Stephen Courageous. Also provided by. I think this is stupid. Wikipedia TV website, some TV website that I look at. Honey, we don't need to do this. Yeah, provided by. Uh, Let's just get out of here, Chuck Berry. TVTango.com. This is terrible. Uh, what else? What websites do I look at? Come on. Weird history something. No, we're not. All right, anyway. Take this out. I'll take it. <laughs> Fuck yeah. So dumb. I'm All right. It in. No, take it out. I got to take a dump. All right. Anyway, we. Love everybody. I care about all of you.
please um, shout us a review. No, thank you for listening. All of you that are still listening after all this time. This yeah. is like we're almost on 100 episodes. And you've wasted a lot of time on you've, us. Yeah, you've taken a lot of shits listening to our so voices. So we owe you for all the time you poop and listen to our podcast. Yes. And we do are doing a contest for our 100th episode. Those of you who are pooping while you listen to us, uh, yeah. please tweet that you're pooping while you listen to us. And, we and send will, a video. And send a video, and we will <laughs> post it. On <laughs> and we will enjoy it. <laughs> and we'll mention you. No, if anybody wants to be mentioned on our 100th episode... Um, just tweet us or send us a message, and we'll say we'll just say on our hundredth yeah. episode whatever you want, whatever you want. Yeah, we'll say whatever you want as as long as it's not racist. Yeah, we won't say racist things or sexist or misogynist or, but any insults are to us are, are yeah. we'll take whatever you want. Any otherwise. other things you want us to say, like if you just want to hear my voice or say, hurtful to say, uh, uh, you know third parties, we won't say anything. Bazoinga. hurtful. Bazoinga. Like if you want us to say weird things like that, we'll say them on our 100th episode. Nobody's going to ask that. Let's be honest. We'll say whatever anybody wants us to say anytime. That's true. All anyway, right. thanks Time for listening. Here, there Chuck are some Barry. people listening, and we love you. Thank you. God bless you, Brett Nelson. Matt Truman Ego Trip is the band that does all the music for this. It's the greatest band in history. They they should be doing concerts. All right. Bye-bye. I love Matt Truman. You look a man, too. That Truman Ego Trip. I said, we're so tired of hearing about Samantha, that's a hickey. When you were all alone, no watchtower, a kiss in the sky. Well, I was barely a glimmer in my young daddy's eyes. I said, that we're so tired of hearing about the six days. One more time, I said, we're so tired of hearing about. American Timelines is a member of the Queen City Podcast Network, powered by Ortho Carolina. Find out more at QueenCityPodcastNetwork.com. Samantha. Samantha.